Well, good morning. I'm Vice Dean Peter Lewis, and welcome uh, to SICE for those of you who are visiting, and welcome to Kenny for those of you who are uh, students and members of the community. Uh, on behalf of all of us here at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, welcome. Uh, today, it's my pleasure uh, and honor to welcome Admiral Michael Mullen, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, as part of our Dean's Forum series. Admiral Mullen served as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff from 2007 to 2011. Uh, serving as the top military advisor to two presidents, George W. Bush and President Barack Obama. Uh, in 2011, he retired after serving 43 years in uniform. He is currently a visiting professor at the Woodrow Wilson School of International and Public Affairs at Princeton University. You may have heard of them. They're, they're just a little bit to the north. They do some international relations stuff, too. In 1968, he graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis. Admiral Mullen is also a graduate of the Advanced Management Program at the Harvard Business School, and he earned a Master of Science degree in Operations Research from the Naval Postgraduate School. Prior to becoming chairman, Mullen served as the 28th Chief of Naval Operations in 2003, and a year later, he took concurrent command of U.S. Naval Forces Europe and Allied Joint Force Command uh, situated in Naples, Italy. In this dual role, he commanded the combined and joint NATO forces in the Balkans. Admiral Mullen oversaw the end of the combat mission in Iraq and the development of a new military strategy in Afghanistan while promoting international partnerships, new technologies, and new counterterrorism tactics which culminated in the killing of Osama bin Laden. He is known for his efforts on behalf of service members, veterans, and their families, and he is renowned for his role in dismantling Don't Ask, Don't Tell and allowing LGBT service members to serve openly. Admiral Mullen was an active military diplomat, has been an active military diplomat and statesman, encouraging improved military-to-military -military relations throughout the world. He led the U.S. delegations that successfully negotiated uh, nuclear arms reductions under the New START Treaty with the Russians, met with the Chinese, Japanese, and South Korean chiefs to ease tensions in East Asia, and laid the groundwork for increasing America's presence in the Pacific. Today, the developing situation on the Korean Peninsula has opened the door for the potential denuclearization of North Korea and a formal end to the Korean War. With President Trump and Kim Jong-un uh, expected to meet later this month, Admiral Mullen's perspective will be invaluable to us all. Uh, today's event uh, I will moderate. Uh, the sort of run of show is going to be uh, comments by uh, Admiral Mullen. Uh, then we're going to sit down and uh, chat a bit and maybe do some follow-up conversation. And then we're opening uh, to questions and answers and comments from the, uh, from the audience. Uh, before I bring Admiral Mullen to the stage, I just want to remind everybody to turn off or silence your cell phones. Uh, nothing like chirping and, and snatches of uh, Beethoven and Mozart in the middle of a speech to get everybody's attention. Um, and finally, please welcome, please join me, rather, in welcoming Admiral Michael Mullen to the stage. Thank you, Peter. I appreciate that relatively short introduction. Uh, the briefer, the better. And thanks to SICE for inviting me to speak on one of the most important issues confronting global leaders today, North Korea. As I've been watching the developments on the peninsula unfold and reading countless predictions of the future, I've been thinking about the past a lot. More than 50 years ago, I left my childhood home in Los Angeles, moved across the country and walked through Gate 1 at the Naval Academy in Annapolis 
to begin my career in the United States military. A few weeks after I arrived, a now famous political ad aired on television. It depicted a young girl in a field tearing petals off a daisy, counting to 10 in her childlike voice. And as she gets to the last petal, the camera zooms to her eye, and the reverse countdown begins. 10, 9, 8, in a man's voiceover. When he reaches one, the screen is filled with a mushroom cloud, the explosion of a nuclear weapon. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd, the voiceover says at the end of the ad. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. The ad was immediately controversial, understandably, and in the end, it only aired that one time. It's true, however, that the stakes of that time felt very high, and they were. Just two years before the Daisy ad, the United States came closer than ever to nuclear war during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Americans really didn't need a commercial to remind them of the gravity of the nuclear threat. In my view, however, the stakes we face today are just as high. Despite recent developments, I believe we're closer than ever to a nuclear war with North Korea. Don't get me wrong, I'm encouraged by President Trump's willingness to sit down with Kim Jong-un and by the steps taken to date in preparation for their meeting. China and our allies in South Korea appear to be pretty optimistic after their own leader summits with Kim. And I think it's an opportunity we do have to pursue. I want these talks to be successful, obviously, and so should everyone in the world. There are a few things that would make the global community safer than to see North Korea actually give up their nuclear weapons and their ability to build more. But most of us who have spent a lifetime working on national security remain a bit skeptical. We've seen this movie before, or at least one similar to it. Though the details of the United States and North Korea summit haven't been announced, I understand a date and location have been set. When it happens, it will be the first time a United States president has sat across from a North Korean dict dictator. But it won't be the first time North Korea has been ready to come to the table. In fact, Kim's strategy seems to be borrowed straight from the playbook his father and grandfather followed. Take some extremely provocative steps, offer to change course or even denuclearize the peninsula, then spend months or years negotiating all the while buying time to make even more progress on their nuclear agenda. This time, however, Kim is running the plays with a legitimate nuclear capability in his back pocket. It's hard for me to convey just how much I hope this time is different, that we are able to negotiate measurable, verifiable reductions in North Korea's program, which could perhaps be matched by a reduction of U.S. forces over time. Peace on the Korean Peninsula is long overdue. But given our experience, I think we do need to prepare for the possibility that Kim Jong-un hasn't changed, that the talks may fall far short of what's needed, or that the talks may fall apart altogether. We need to plan for the likelihood that even if the talks seem to be productive, the North Koreans have no intention of honoring their word. And we need to prepare for the possibility that we may, may again find ourselves where we were just a couple of months ago with the President of the United States casually threatening a nuclear holocaust over Twitter. By then, however, two things will have changed from before. First, he will be relying on the guidance of, of a few new players including his new national security advisor, John Bolton, who has made it clear where he stands on this issue. Just a couple of months ago, Bolton published an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, making a full-throated, if short-sighted, case for military action against the Kim regime. Second, if the talks do fall apart, the failure is likely to stir the President's most bellicose and aggressive um, instincts. I don't think anyone who has been paying attention to the past few years doubts that. So in my view, war in North Korea remains a realistic possibility. And it could all unfurl very quickly. 
In fact, I have no doubt that if it starts, it will unfurl quickly. If the summit goes poorly, one could make the case that President Trump tried the diplomatic route, it didn't work, and therefore a military response is appropriate. That logic may seem reasonable to some. I assure you, it's not. I think it is time for us to have a real honest conversation as Americans about what a military conflict with North Korea could mean for our country and for the world. I'm not here to wade into politics or even to publicly advocate for one specific policy or another. What I want to do is provide a little bit of context. I want to help ensure we all understand the sea change we've seen over the past year and, perhaps more importantly, how our own leaders are responding. I want to make certain there is no mistaking what the military option entails. To begin, it's important to understand a few things about the dictator on the other side, Kim Jong-un. Number one, at this moment, Kim has, has at his disposal not only dozens of nuclear weapons, but also chemical weapons, biological weapons, intercontinental ballistic missiles, 1.2 million troops, and a country filled with people who've been brainwashed into thinking he's some sort of deity. Number two, he's smarter and more strategic than most people realize. Number three, he is unpredictable. He's obsessed with maintaining power and will go to whatever lengths he must in pursuit of that goal. Finally, even as he seeks recognition from the United States, he is fully convinced that we are on a mission to take him out. In other words, there's no reason to believe he would be prudent in the face of what he perceived to be a real, legitimate threat from the United States. But this is nothing new. Kim's disruptive antics have been on display for years now. What has changed is our own president. I know President Trump has recently expressed optimism and commented on how honorable he finds Mr. Kim to be. But for most of his presidency, he didn't miss an opportunity to provoke or even threaten the man he nicknamed Little Rocket Man. Talking is not the answer, he tweeted just a few months ago. Later, when a reporter followed up and asked whether he planned to attack North Korea, he responded, we'll see. We'll see. Now, I know some, some may argue that this was strategic. They say President Trump was simply applying the pressure and that pressure is precisely what brought Kim to the table. At the time those statements were made, many claimed he was keeping Kim on his toes, that the cavalier way President Trump threatens war would cause Kim not to consider military action of his own, but the exact opposite, to think twice before messing with the United States or its allies. Maybe, but it's a heck of a gamble. Because rhetorically, President Trump has already walked all the way out to the edge of the cliff. There's not much further he can go. There isn't much space between fire and fury, locked and loaded, and pull the trigger. He's even quipped about the nuclear button he has ready to go. Ladies and gentlemen, I had the privilege of serving as our highest ranking military official to our, in our country for two different presidents. I don't know if I can fully convey to you how shocking it is to hear the Commander-in-Chief talk about nuclear weapons with such nonchalance. I've done a few panel discussions over the past year or so, and when I take questions from the audience, someone inevitably asks me about the nuclear football. They'll ask, how long does it take to launch a nuclear missile? The President travels everywhere with the football. If President Trump decided to go for it to launch a nuclear strike, what happens next? How much time passes? What are the steps involved? Et cetera, et cetera. Here's the answer. It doesn't take very long. The military is inclined to follow orders. And when I was chairman, we didn't drill much on this. Whether I was in the tank at the Pentagon or the Situation Room at the White House, the only time nuclear weapons ever came up in either administration was in the context of disarmament and nonproliferation. They were not in play, certainly not in a first from a first strike perspective. 
and I want to underscore, and I've studied these weapons, that's the way it should be. Thankfully, President Trump seemed to be the only one musing about a preemptive United States nuclear strike. But a so-called bloody nose attack on Kim's military facilities, a strike large enough to shock the Koreans into realizing we're serious, but small enough to keep them from responding in kind, that's a strategy that has reportedly received serious consideration. It is a strategy we considered in the past as well. The problem is, in my judgment, the risk is through the roof. Is it possible Kim will take the hit and back down? It's possible. Is it more likely his, his bruised ego will lead him to lash out and at a minimum send a few missiles into Seoul, the largest city in South Korea, where roughly 230,000 Americans live, including tens of thousands of U.S. troops? You bet it is. It's certainly true that, in the right situation, a targeted strike can send a strong signal that ultimately deters an adversary. But that only works when you're dealing with a counterpart who is rational, who understands the signals you're sending. We have no reason to believe Kim Jong-un will respond to a bloodied nose by backing down. It is just as likely, if not more so, he will respond by drawing blood on our side, too. And once we get to that point, our ability to control the conflict only becomes more and more diminished. In the military, you learn pretty quickly that all war is unpredictable. But even in the best case scenario, a military conflict that doesn't involve weapons of mass destruction, the cost of this war in blood and treasure would likely, would likely be astronomical. To start out on the Korean Peninsula would probably require troop levels in the hundreds of thousands from the United States, far more than we've deployed to any conflict since Vietnam. The death toll would be high from day one, and over the opening days of the conflict, the Congressional Research Service estimates that North Korea could kill hundreds of thousands of people in Seoul using conventional weapons alone. In the end, it's entirely possible that millions would die, including tens of thousands of Americans. The economic consequence would be massive as well, potentially hitting us harder than anything we've experienced in recent history. Even if the American homeland is spared from an attack, American taxpayers will feel the impact of this war in one way or another. South Korea would be the biggest country to experience a military conflict within its borders in the past seven decades. It's the 11th largest economy in the world, and Seoul is home to half of the country's people and economy. That means a 50% drop in South Korea's GDP would take an entire point off the global GDP. A recent report noted the disastrous impacts for the electronics and automobile sectors in particular, not to mention energy and global shipping. And it's not just South Korea businesses that would be affected. Far from it. For example, more than 10% of Apple's suppliers are from South Korea. In today's globalized world, economies everywhere, including here, would be shaken to their core. And then there are the costs of rebuilding Korea after the bloodshed stops. The price tag which South Korea has estimated would run around $1 trillion. A group called Capital Economics has projected that if the United States were to spend proportionally the same amount on reconstruction in South Korea as we did in Iraq and Afghanistan, we would add another 30 percent of GDP to our national debt. This is, as I said, a best case scenario, one in which only conventional weapons are used. But it's impossible to accurately game out the escalation when you're up against such an erratic adversary and one whose arms are well beyond conventional. We know, for example, that Kim Jong-un has up to 5,000 metric tons of chemical weapons in his arsenal, including deadly nerve agents like sarin. And we have no reason to believe he'd even try to spare civilian life. He murdered his own brother at a public airport last year using an extremely lethal gas called VX. To be blunt, Kim has access to some of the most fearsome substances on Earth, substances that have the capacity to kill millions in a relatively short span of time. 
Still, even that would be preferable to a nuclear war. And if we engage in a military conflict with North Korea, we must be prepared for the possibility that nuclear weapons may be used on either side. This is something I think that most Americans, and actually most human beings, cannot fully fathom. People in my generation remember what it was like to be on the brink of nuclear war. We remember drills in school, ducking and covering under our desks. We remember the sober speeches from Presidents Ford and Kennedy and Johnson. But several decades have passed since then. Thankfully, most of the world has embraced, has embraced a path of nonproliferation. The Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty is almost 50 years old. We've been steadily reducing our nuclear stockpile since 1967, with the goal of one day eliminating nuclear weapons from the Earth altogether. And I applaud this effort. I recently joined the board of the Nonpartisan Nuclear Threat Initiative, and I fully support the Global Zero Movement, led by Senator Sam Nunn and Dick Lugar. But there have been consequences. The fact is that as the years have gone by and the world's priorities have shifted from makely, making nuclear weapons to eliminating nuclear weapons, we've lost our familiarity with their power. In the military, we've not invested enough in maintaining the expertise our forces once had with these weapons. Beyond the military, we've lost touch with our collective ability to truly comprehend just how devastating these nuclear weapons are. In the wake of World War II, the reports from what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki were nearly impossible to ignore. I still remember reading about the blasts, trying to understand how it was possible that people at the heart of the explosion were vaporized so quickly that their shadows remained, burnt into nearby stone. Today, you don't hear about what happens when a nuclear bomb goes off. Those at or near the explosion's hypercenter die instantly, of course, but that's just the beginning. People lucky enough to survive the initial blast are likely to be killed shortly thereafter by collapsing infrastructure or fires stoked by the heat flash that the bomb unleashes. Soon the area will be surrounded by a firestorm, which can create deadly hurricane force winds. People who may have made their way to underground shelters and survive the initial hit and heat flash will probably die as well, as all of the oxygen is sucked into the atmosphere. And as you get further and further from the blast site, you will find a gradually increasing percentage of survivors. But the injuries will be overwhelming, and many will never recover. And then there's the radioactive fallout which is difficult to approximate in advance, and to, e and to which even moderate exposure often leads to death. The people who manage to make it through every one of these impacts may one day suffer from radiation-induced cancers, and they may not know they've been affected for decades. Even the children of those exposed to radiation aren't safe. Statistically, they're more likely to, be, to to be born with abnormalities to develop or to develop leukemia. It's difficult to grasp the extent of the death and destruction we would see, but those outcomes are a bit easier to calculate than some of the others. For example, we don't know for certain how the detonation of multiple nuclear weapons would affect our atmosphere, but some scientists predict a nuclear winter. With a layer of smoke and dust collecting in the atmosphere, blocking the sun's rays from hitting the Earth's surface. This would have a dramatic implications for life on our planet. It's also difficult to anticipate what would happen to the international community we've spent the past seven decades building and reinforcing. The entire world changed after World War II, the last and only time nuclear weapons were used. We can't predict exactly how countries like China will respond. There are too many variables at play. One thing is for sure, if the United States were to strike first for the second time, we would almost certainly become an international pariah. When we think of, nuclear, of a nuclear bomb exploding, this chain of events isn't what we picture, not most of us, anyway. 
we picture the mushroom cloud. At this point, nearly all Americans of all generations have what my friend and mentor Bob Gates calls a cartoonish sense of these weapons. But war with North Korea would not be a cartoon. It would be very, very real. I know that what I'm describing is pretty grim. The truth is, as person after person who sat in the Oval Office has found, there are no good options. But there are, without question, bad and worse options. And the American people deserve to know the difference. It is unfortunate, but nonetheless true, that the United States has gotten used to being, in a, being a country at war. Our men and women in uniform have been deploying to Iraq and Afghanistan for a decade and a half. But while hundreds of thousands of families have been affected, there are plenty of people who don't know a single person who has served in either conflict. Less than one half of 1% of our population is in the military today. For many, it's probably easy to forget there are troops deployed at this very moment, risking their lives for our security. It's a troubling reality, but it's also why it's critical for Americans to understand war with North Korea would be nothing like war in Iraq and Afghanistan. On al almost every level, a conflict on the Korean Peninsula would dwarf the wars to which we've sadly grown accustomed. When I was younger, I used to love history class. My sons were the same. I can remember coming home one evening to find out one of my sons with his, find one of my sons with his books open, studying hard at the kitchen table. And I asked him what his test was on, and he told me the Vietnam War. I stopped for a minute and had to process what he'd said. It hadn't occurred to me that Vietnam was history at that point in the 90s. Still today, I carry the residual scars of that conflict. And I'm sure most of the men and women who served at that time would say the same. Every time we send our young people off to war, every time, we're, lock, we're, we're locking them into a lifelong healing process. That's how long it stays with you. And it's not just the men and women who serve, it's their entire families who feel the impact of war. It lasts generations. I'm not someone who believes war is to be avoided at all costs, but I do believe it should be the absolute last resort. And I do believe it is too easy for the United States to go to war today. It is too easy for the United States to go to war today. Over the years, the power of the presidency has increased dramatically. The check on the president is supposed to be the Congress. But this Congress seems to have proven they will not stand up to much. This will continue until the American people force them to change. We have to remind our leaders in Washington who their bosses really are. And for that reason, it has never been more important for the American public to be engaged, informed, participate, and be vocal. In particular, it is critical for young people, like the students of this school, to make their voices heard. Young men and women are forcing our elected leaders to treat issues of life and death with the seriousness they deserve. And I just had a chance to talk to a few SCI students before we came in, and my message to them was clear. Don't allow our leaders to backslide on the progress we've made with respect to nuclear nonproliferation. Do not allow them to treat nuclear war with nonchalance. Do not allow them to take to take grave risks with our servicemen and women because the American families, your families, will suffer the consequences for decades to come. In some ways, what we're facing today reminds me of what I faced when I started my career in Annapolis back in 1964. The challenges were enormous, the stakes were high, and things got worse before they got better. But they did get better. The United States got through Vietnam, and we became a stronger country for it. Today, too, the challenges are enormous, the stakes are unmistakably high, and things may well get worse before they get better. But they don't have to get worse. We need leaders 
at all levels, in all parts of our society, and certainly leaders at the top. And these leaders need to be committed to unifying this country, not dividing it. We need citizens who might sit on the sideline to step into the arena. We need those who are inclined to quiet down, to pipe up. And if we can do that, if we, if we can recognize the magnitude of what we're facing and meet this moment, then there's no doubt in my mind that we will get through this tough period. And when we do, we will be a better, stronger country for it. Thank you and God bless America. Well, Admiral Mullen, thank you so much for sharing your views with us uh, and obviously providing uh, a very sobering reminder of what the stakes are and what may be overlooked in some of the rhetoric and the day-to-day -day analysis. And so I think we might begin by asking uh, about the process that seems to be underway and that is the focus of everybody's uh, attentions. And I'll begin by asking, how credible do you think, based on your experience, your observation, your engagement in these issues over time, how credible do you think these overtures are, particularly from uh, North Korea? And what might be the strategic calculus behind them? Well, I think the strategic calculus for Kim Jong-un in just about everything he does is survival. And to ensure that his regime doesn't change. Um, and I've long since moved away from any idea that we should try to affect regime change there. I think that's something that uh, has to be essentially generated uh, out of his own people, which is a tall order, and I understand that as well. If I just look at the empirical data in the last 20 years, you know, regime change hasn't gone that well for us. Um, and that's really impactful to me. Uh, I'm encouraged, as I said in my remarks, I'm encouraged by the fact that the two leaders are going to talk. Uh, I give President Trump a lot of credit for moving the needle on this, and there have been multiple other presidents, multiple other administrations who have not been able to do that. Um, uh, the worry is the uncertainty. We don't know this guy, first of all. It's still, North Korea still remains, despite uh, individual insights very much a black hole in terms of what we really understand about the country uh, or about him in particular. He's been, he's been brutally ruthless in consolidation of power in a very short period of time. He has tested these programs at a rate far exceeding any of that of his dad or of his grandfather. And to me, that's a message of I want to get to these programs. Uh, and he's achieved something, from my perspective, very strategic in the sense that he's going to be the first North Korean leader to sit down with the leader from America, with the leader from America. That's something his father and grandfather sought over the last 40 plus years and didn't get. Uh, what, what is very difficult, to, and I just don't think anybody, despite multiple predictions, I don't think anybody really knows how this is going to go. Mm -hmm. And then the other question I think that, that comes to mind when we, when we look at this is what, who's, who do you think is driving events? I mean, there are obviously a lot of different narratives here. Uh, some elements close to the White House say that the president shook things loose through tweets and uh, provocative statements and, and uh, demonstrated a resolve and a willingness to, to go further than previous presidents. Uh, president uh, Kim. Uh, has demonstrated uh, a strategic calculus in terms of uh, rapidly advancing his, the demonstration of his capabilities yeah. and then pivoting to diplomacy, yeah. and people have, have observed that. President Moon of South Korea has responded uh, in, in favorable ways to the prospect of uh, discussions and, and some uh, uh, diplomatic engagement. 
And uh, Xi Jinping demonstrated uh, prior to the summit uh, some leverage uh, with North Korea, but, but then seems to be on the sidelines. So it's, it's difficult to untangle where the center of gravity is here and wh who or what is driving events. So what's your sense of that? Well, I think everybody wants to try to understand the puzzle that you just laid out. Right. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's not, my, in my view, it's not clearly understandable. I, I think we know, for instance, I mean, those of us that have studied this area know there's no love lost between North Korea and, and their leaders, and this leader in particular, Kim Jong-un and President Xi Jinping. Uh, and yet Kim went there the other day um, and was received, obviously, by Xi Jinping. Um, to me, the, that part of that signal was, don't forget we're here. You know, China's, and I, I believe for some time, contrary to what most of my Chinese colleagues or Chinese uh, leaders that I have met have said, which is they're limited on what they can do. I just think it, they have, they have a stranglehold on the economy in North Korea, period. And they can, they can have great effect there or choose not to. They seem to, in recent, in recent months, have clamped down uh, on the sanctions in terms of having an impact. How serious that is, I'm not sure. I think we talked about this before when I, when I met with the students. One of the things that those of, in the, those of us in the West don't have a very good understanding of is what it means to wake up every day and wonder if you're going to live through the day. And that's what dictators uh, and uh, despots do every day. And they've been doing it since they were this high, and they're really good at it. And it's not a coherent thought in the Western mind. And so too often, we might think we're talking to somebody about something that we understand them, but we're just talking past each other. That's, that's a real dynamic here as well. I think in the end, as I said, Kim wants to survive. Um, and how... I, I think we're, we also don't do a very good job taking into consideration their national security interests. China doesn't believe we're going to spend much time on China's national security interests. And I think if we're going to get anywhere, we're going to have to have some reflection on what those might be and actually give to some degree. China does not want U.S. troops on its border. It doesn't want the instability of a regime coming apart in the north. Uh, I think we could reach an accommodation of, if it gets to this point, who handles the nuclear material, which we've all, we, the United States, has, have always been committed to, to handling if something went south. Um, and I'm also fine, and this is, uh, some people aren't, I'm fine with President Moon and South Korea taking the lead on this. This is, this is their home. Uh, this is their peninsula. Uh, and they have vested interest in it to a fairly well. So I, I don't think it can be done without the United States, and I don't think it can be done without China. Strategically, one of the things I just can't get out of my head is here we have the dictator of a you know, very, very small country, almost by any dimension, and somehow he has got the great powers in play, just like his grandfather did. I, I can only hope that we can figure out a way that he doesn't do what his grandfather did, which was turn this into a conflict. So let me ask a, um, a question that would be very close to your area of expertise and your experience, which is if we imagine that we move forward to some type of agreement uh, and some form of de denuclearization is envisioned. Uh, we get to uh, the end of the Korean War. A, a treaty is signed, a, a non-aggression pact. Uh, and we imagine uh, some or full demobilization of US forces uh, on the peninsula. Is that likely? What would that entail? What would, the, what would the components of that look like? I think we underestimate, and it's talked about frequently now, I think we underestimate the significance uh, in the region, but in particular to the peninsula of the U.S. troops who were there. 
while I was chairman, <clears throat> we reduced uh, at Secretary Rumsfeld and President uh, Bush's initiative, we, we came down from, I think, 35,000 U.S. troops on the ground to 28,500. And I'm telling you, the Koreans, South Koreans, track every one of those bodies. Uh, it, is seen as, it is seen as almost a guarantee of our support and their security. So there would have to be a lot of work to undo that presence over a long period of time. Is it doable? I think eventually it would be. But you have a rising China. That's a huge concern. Uh, obviously, you've still got, right now, you've got the North Korean threat. So I would think that theoretically that's possible, but that is a long way off. The other, my other thought on that is, is, uh, is look at the, the positive outcome of the troop presence that we've had since World War II, uh, whether it was Germany or Japan or in South Korea. It's been pretty extraordinary, and it just didn't happen by luck. I mean, it was a security guarantee. So I think we have to be careful with uh, any steps which unravel that. Uh, and we, we are now several generations into citizens in those countries who've lived through this and, uh, and have great regard for that. So, and it's my own experience, particularly on the peninsula, is this, this is very close to the South Korean people. So it would have to be handled very, very carefully. Mm -hmm. And then finally, and then we'll open it up uh, to uh, uh, general participation. Um, let, let's imagine that this goes forward uh, in, in the favorable way that many people are anticipating. I think even in a, in a very rosy uh, outlook, there are going to be many opaque features of North Korean capability. I mean, there may be a shuttering of some nuclear facilities, but there would be a near certainty that there would be uh, capabilities that were latent or, or hidden. Uh, the, shuttering of nuclear facilities wouldn't touch the chemical and biological and even the conventional uh, artillery tubes that you've referenced. So if we get to uh, a non-aggression agreement, um, we get to a shuttering of some obvious or, or visible uh, North Korean nuclear capability, uh, and they retain, nonetheless, uh, considerable capability to threaten the South. Um, what has changed from the status quo ante? Uh, in other words, how significant would it be if we, if we get through these? I realize that it would be seen as historically a tectonic shift, but um, from your perspective, how much would change? Well, if we, I mean, along the lines of the really, every, all the options are bad some worse than others. But if we were to be able to take the worst off the table, then I think that would give us the possibility to work the rest. Um, what I worry about now is with the capability that no matter what we do, those are in the game. Uh, in addition to not focusing on uh, the devastation of these weapons, and it's, I struggle with words to describe it, there are medical histories that are really worth, reason, really worth reading of survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki to remind us of how <coughs> devastating these weapons are. But the other thing we haven't done much of since the end of the Cold War, and this, this as an academic institution I would, I would argue would be a good place to do it, is the whole issue of strategic deterrence for nuclear weapons, for any of these weapons but nuclear weapons in particular because they are so devastating. And that really worked you know, with the Soviets. Uh, we have not invested much in that, my own view, in, in that at all. So um, I, I, I do worry this guy's, a, this guy's a bad guy, first of all. Secondly, um, I mean, just look at what he's done uh, inside his own regime. Um, his entire lineage has lied about whatever they've done. So how do you, it's just like Iran. We know that they lie and we know that they cheat. The question is, can you put a regime in place 
that gives you a very, very high confidence level of verification that, they're, mm -hmm. that they are unable to uh, get around, if you will, to continue to develop these capabilities. If you can't do that, then, then it's, almost, it's almost a waste of time. It's, and it's the same, the same is true on the Iran deal. That the, one of the reasons I supported that deal is because I actually went through the technical regime, the technical verification regime, which is the most extensive we've ever had on Earth, uh, and uh, developed a level of comfort that it's going to be a lot more difficult for them to cheat than it has been in the past, with an expectation is they'll still try. So, uh, and then I guess lastly, uh, there, the, the, one of the point, points I made in remarks is we've been on this reduction path for a long time, which has almost conditioned us to not think about using these weapons and what they can do from a state-sponsored standpoint, much less a terrorist. You know, I know for a fact that terrorists have been trying to get their hands on these weapons for some time. And it's, this is a global issue. It's not just the United States or China or South Korea or Japan. It is a global issue. Um, and that if we don't get our hands, on this, our hands around this, I worry that if he gets to keep his weapons, some people do say, well, just, let's just uh, contain them. And I just don't sign up for that. I'm not in that camp. Because uh, with the uncertainty that the United States has generated in terms of allied support globally in the last several years, not just in the last two, you hear discussions in South Korea. You hear discussions in Japan. You hear discussions in Saudi Arabia. You hear discussions in Egypt and Turkey they all might well develop nuclear capability if these two countries have it. And I think that'd be a nightmare for the world. OK. So we'll open it up. Uh, yes, please. We'll do one at a time. And please, please introduce yourself and, and make a brief, uh, brief question. Uh, my name is Kimberly Jenkins. I'm one of Homeland Security's new Far East analysts. Um, I was a Middle East analyst until about a month and a half ago. Um, but it seems to me that even if these are successful talks and um, we start working on denuclearization, that it puts Russia and China both in a position where they are going to play in that game and could develop almost their own axis with North Korea, Russia, and China that could be a, a significant problem uh, for us and really a significant problem even at the level of the United Nations. And I guess I'd just be interested in knowing what your thoughts are on that possible alliance developing and what impact it might have. One of the reasons I decry our, what's going on with our relationship with Russia, in particular President Putin, is we have no relationship. And uh, I'm not about uh, putting my arms around the guy and embracing him, but he does get a vote at the UN. He knows that. He is on a geopolitical expansion to have as much, in my view, as much impact as he can and restore as much of what they used to be as possible. So we're going to have to deal with them. And to deal with them, we've got to, have, we got to engage them. And I've said this many times, even at the height of the Cold War, you know, we had multiple lines, multiple channels with the Soviets that we could at least talk to them about a given situation to make sure it didn't spin out of control. Um, I would argue that it's been decent with China in the last 10 or 15 years, that our leaders, all of them, including this president, have worked to develop a relationship with the leadership there. So uh, because Russia is going to get a lead vote on most of these issues, the way China seems to execute its votes in the UN is oftentimes in follow uh, or abstaining uh, based on what Russia wants to do. But I think that clearly will evolve as China gets its feet more and more under itself globally for, to, to be impactful as the global power that it clearly is economically right now and seems to want to be militarily. So there's a strategic piece there that, that uh, we have to deal with at the UN. Um, and, and then there's an operational tactical military piece in terms of 
the kind of alignment that uh, existed in you know 1950, uh, and doing all we can to mitigate the outcomes of that, the, the conflict outcomes of that, I think is going to be are, is is going to be really important. Um, and, and again, that's going to take engagement at every level, not just mill to mill, but certainly diplomatically uh, and from a, from a leader to leader standpoint as well. And I think, you know, I made, I made the comment in my remarks about the impact on the global economy. If, if we go to war, if there's a war on that peninsula, the global economy is going in the tank. And it's going to affect everybody in the world. It is home to notionally four of the five top economies in the world, and everybody's going to suffer dramatically. Um, which is another imperative to get this right. And, and even in the very narrow space that's here, to include getting rid of the nuclear weapons and not going to war, that's really, really critical. We solve this diplomatically, which gets me back to I'm encouraged by the fact that we're having a conversation. It is fraught. What the president has done is high risk. My training is you know, high risk, there's high reward, and there's a really deep, tough downside potential as well. Go ahead. Uh, Dan Lieberman. Uh, yeah, we... The whole point of pressure was to have uh, North Korea uh, stop their nuclear developments, but the result of the pressure was they augmented their nuclear developments. They even supposedly were able to have a hydrogen explosion and also develop intercontinental ballistic missile. So it seems that pressure is a complete failure as a tactic. So is there any reason to apply any more pressure? But the second question is, they keep saying that the U.S. has to be part of a North-South agreement, but the North and South have a certain conflict. They look at it a certain way. They have the certain needs and wants, but the U.S. is not a mediator. It doesn't look at the conflict in the same way. The U.S. has its own individual needs and wants. So by putting the U.S. in the mix, aren't you complicating a solution of a North-South agreement? I'm not sure. I think that it's a good question. I think that because we've been in the mix in so many places for so long, people sometimes don't know how to do it without us. I think if we could get to a point, I mean, I would be fine if we get to a point if the North and the South could work this out. I mean, there clearly are legal and international ramifications tied to the war, tied to the, you know, signing a, signing a peace treaty, the whole tie into the UN, where well, the U.S. just couldn't back away. Plus, I just believe that it's going to be hard to get this done without the U.S. and China, and, and Russia to some degree. I've asked friends in the last two or three years in, that, in the Far East about Russia, because it's sort of been, it used to, Russia used to be a big deal, particularly in my life in the Navy out there in that part of the world, and it, they've been quiet. Well, the last couple of years, the response has been much more aggressive uh, on the part of the Russians. So I think that's where the U.S. comes to play. I, as I said earlier, I'm not wedded to the fact that U.S. lead this and take all the credit in the world, quite frankly. I'd, I'd like to get it solved. Um, and I'd like to get beyond just the nuclear weapons, because he's got a ridiculous arsenal of biological and chemical weapons, which are illegal. Um, that's a, that, this is a tall order, and it's going to take some time to do it. Um, the pressure, I think you can probably look at the pressure either way. I mean, China brought a lot more pressure on him. Is that why he came? I, we don't know much about the guy. I, in the end, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure, and I don't think anybody can tell you exactly why he's doing what he's doing. That's the uncertainty that he, Kim Jong-un, brings to the table. Uh, yeah, back there. Yeah, you had, yeah. Hi, uh, Phil Schrafer, uh, former active duty uh, Marine. Uh, Admiral, don't you think uh, General Mattis will bring a healthy uh, balance to uh, Bolton? And two, do you think that Kim Jong-un is either irrational or suicidal? Um, I think it's really important to watch what happens today to take a read on Mattis. We all knew where Mattis was when the Iran deal came up a couple months ago. So President Trump at 2 o'clock this afternoon is going to make a decision. And I think 
uh, that will be a measure. Uh, um, I, I, I'd like to say I know what's going to happen. I have no idea what's going to happen, but that'll be a measure. And as I said in my remarks, the players have changed. So what does that mean? Um, what happens this afternoon? Again, it's hard for me to it's hard for me to draw a direct line from where we've been to get to talks to what we do in Iran and what what does that mean for the summit between Kim Jong-un and President Trump. I actually don't know that. Um, obviously, everybody's involved in this right now, and it's gonna, this is a huge decision today and a huge undertaking uh, the end of May or first week of June, whenever, whenever it's going to happen. But I think uh, when, you, when you look at the rhetoric and I caution people on this. When you look at the rhetoric of John Bolton, the rhetoric of Mike Pompeo, uh, you know, will Mattis hold? I, that's how I'd put it. I, I just don't know. Will he hold serve, if you will, on Iran? And then what does that mean for North Korea? There'll be a, there'll be a lot of speculation if President Trump uh, gets out of the Iran deal some way or another about exactly this and then there's you know there will be no evidence between now and when the talks occur in terms of what's going to happen we just don't know and one of the things that I've cautioned people about despite our president's rhetoric is what I have because he's been here now for 14 or 15 months whatever it is I I want to see action on the ground I want to see what actually happens uh, I, I got the rhetoric, but I want to see in execution what actually happens. So if you look at NATO, uh, n we don't know how NAFTA is going to come out, et cetera. Um, if you look at some things that have actually been executed against the rhetoric, it wasn't as severe uh, as it was originally characterized by rhetoric. So we'll see. And I don't think we're going to know between now and May, whenever it is, what actually is going to happen, despite all the pundits. Everybody will have a view of what's going to happen, but honestly, I just don't believe we'll know. This, this woman here had her hand up. Yeah, we'll get to you, and then we'll, we'll shift to this side in a moment. Um, Yang Lo Yoon, Foundation for Empowerment. First of all, as a Korean and as a global villager, I really want to thank you for this kind of thoughtful and knowledgeable uh, experience and sharing with us probably. Uh, my question, I have a lot of questions, but I will just uh, restrict myself. As a Korean, you had, I think that the uh, Korean public's uh, views and opinions, sentiments might be very important because that really uh, affects uh, President Moon Jae-in's uh, policy and others. As a Korean, I feel that uh, sometimes Americans don't understand don't, don't seem to understand. Nuclear, nuclear weapon is a sort of like a, a method of, was a method of liberation for us. So we have very different uh, views about it. Second, uh, America has been really blood ally. We have learned, and I still think that way. On the other hand, there has been very closely connected previous military regime which has made the economic progress. So Koreans have very mixed sentiments. Yeah. So this, I think this one is very important to be really factored in the American thinking of the denuclearization and how to deal with this kind of talk. Second, as a development economist who used to work for the UN and the World Bank, I think that the, uh, Kim Jong-un has been really uh, professing two strategies, Byung-jin. Byung-jin means economic progress at the same time, the security. So, so economic progress is very important for him to demonstrate to North Koreans. And as you properly said, I guess, that the, um, China has been strangling um, North Korea. Perhaps not enough, but enough to really uh, give a difficulty. So uh, we all know, I agree with you, that um, Kim Jong-un is desperate about uh, survival. Then he needs to really uh, massage his own cronies and at least Pyongyang people. Now South Korea is far beyond uh, North Korea. He cannot really okay. um, 
Maybe we'll, so, maybe we'll uh, give them a I chance think that to... the, uh, in that case, uh, how should these kind of factors uh, would have affected Kim Jong Un's very recent uh, approach? Thank okay. you very much. Yeah. Yeah. So, so just, just quickly, from my perspective, um, what, some of the things I've learned, and, and I, I want to reiterate that a war in the peninsula is hundreds of thousands of Americans. I was trying to recall, I think at the peak of the Iraq and Afghanistan war, we, we had somewhere max 150 to 200,000. It's hundreds of thousands uh, that, that go, uh, that, that, that were committed in the war plans to send. Um, uh, I've been struck, and not that I'm there much, but I have been struck as I, I've run into young Army officers, U.S. Army officers, who are now on brigade rotations to Korea. I mean, literally since we brought down our footprint uh, dramatically in Afghanistan and Iraq, that, and that seems to be the place to go. That's a signal that is obviously a very, it's a very high priority. Uh, when I was chairman during uh, Chonan and Waipido, the incidents, I was really struck by the young people in South Korea who basically got the president's attention, President Lee's attention, to say, what's going on here, in ways that their parents and grandparents had sort of tolerated over time. That was 2010. I have also was struck in the Olympics by a fact that didn't get much play, but that the 20-somethings in South Korea are no longer interested in unification. Now, I know that that is a huge issue. I just haven't figured out all the implications. And so those of us in the West that have said for the last 20 years it's inevitable, uh, and that's going to be a voting block and a tax-paying block in the next 10 to 20 years in South Korea. To your, to your point, we need to pay a lot more attention on what's going on on the peninsula with the Korean people. And it is your country. Yes, you're a great ally. Yes, we will support you. But it is your country. And sometimes we don't do that, and we need to do it. The other question, I didn't answer crazy or irrational, right? I don't know. Uh, I've said, I don't think he's a rational actor, but he is, and I'd say he's crazy like a fox, seemingly, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. He is, what I do know is what I said earlier, he's a survivor. He will do anything to survive, anything to survive. My view is he'll use a nuclear weapon to survive, if he thinks he can survive. Whether, and Colin Powell and I talk about it, I mean, Colin's got a different view that if he uses it's a suicide act. I got all that. I've seen dictators, I've seen the worst, most evil people on this earth climb out from under a weapon that should have killed everything living within a ridiculous distance. There's something about these people that they know how to survive. This, this side of the room is utterly silent. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Go ahead. Here. Yeah. No, no, is in the front here. Yeah. Thanks. We'll go. We'll we'll acknowledge the back in a minute. My name is Connie Zulam. I'm with the American Kurdish Information Network. Admiral Mullen, I was wondering if you could address the issue of loyalty towards allies in the American military and foreign policy. When Raqqa was liberated, the commander of American troops in the Middle East thanked Syrian Democratic forces and acknowledged the loss of 650 of their troops adding that no American troop, no American soldier was killed. Three months later, President Trump gave his first State of Union address, took full credit for the fall of Islamic State, and gave a silent treatment to the Kurdish fighters who had contributed to the peace of Orlando and New York. Why this reticence to acknowledge the sacrifices of Kurds and their allies? Second, when President Trump gave you his- only get, You only get two. <laughs> <laughs> when make, President, this, make this a good one. President Trump, in giving his State of Union address, Turkish troops using NATO weapons were pounding the same Kurdish forces in Afrin without any rebuke of condemna or condemnation from Washington. Does loyalty to one's comrades matter in American military or foreign policy? So what's, what's your outfit again? American Kurdish Information Network. Okay, got it. Um, I, didn't, I didn't get that. Now I, I, now I understand the question. Um, <laughs> so what am I going to do with a Kurdish question here? in a forum talking about North Korea. Um, 
I think on balance, first of all, we follow our leaders. I mean, we, we, we really do what uh, our leadership, uh, whatever the policy is. Um, secondly, uh, we, are, we have ridiculously good uh, military to military or colleague to colleague relationships on the ground. It's just who we are as a military. Um, it becomes can it can become much more difficult when you are asking me if I'm a military leader on the ground in Raqqa to make a statement which is which is counter to policy per se typically I'm not going to do that I'm you know I, I on active duty and actually I won't do a lot of it there are retired who will do it but I'm typically not one that will do that uh, I think I am my own view I'm particularly fond of the Kurds. I spent too much time in northern Iraq in particular. I'm not unfamiliar with their background in that regard. I'm very familiar with the relationship that the Kurds have with Turkey. And it is, it is strained and I think it will continue to be strained. In my own view, uh, the United States needs to stay engaged with both sides here because they're, both those relationships are really, really important. And I'm comfortable that our military does Politically, it can be tough. Okay. Yeah. Let's go now. This guy. Can. And the left is um, oh, over here. My name is Ari Middleman. Taking it back to the other side of Asia. Um, so I'm reminded of the first page of the National Defense Strategy, which talks at length about China um, as yeah. as kind of our, our yeah. primary focus Start and threat. Um, uh, it seems like Mongolia is as good a shot as any to host this. Uh, next week, the administration is hosting the Uzbek leader. Can you speak kind of big picture as China's thinking in terms of 2049? What is America's role in Asia over the next generation? Well, I, I believe for a long time that, that the U.S., uh, the, two, the most important bilateral relationship in the world, is that between the United States and China. And I, it's not hard math for me. Fundamentally, it's underpinned by the two biggest economies in the world. And if we do well, and if leaders do well in a constructive fashion, it can make a huge difference for the world. And the downside's pretty, signific pretty signific significant if we, if we can't figure that out. And that's what Donald Trump and Xi Jinping and others are gonna have to figure out. Uh, you've seen what Xi Jinping has done in the last five years, which has been uh, almost record-breaking in terms of consolidating his power. He's the president for life or whatever the right term is. Um, and there's no question he's got this vision for China. We should never underestimate the degree of difficulty he has with 800 million people that don't have much uh, in his own country. And the whole idea of stability in his own country is... A, is, a, is a top of the list uh, in terms of the future versus how am I going to do in the world, which has a lot to do with us. Um, so I, I would hope, I would, one, I'd hope people would recognize what I just said and then work towards a constructive relationship long term. Um, it does not appear in the last 12 or 18 months that's what China wants. Xi Jinping has been pretty strident in what he said. I mean, he gives a speech at Davos two years ago or two Davoses ago that should have been a speech the President of the United States gave. I'm a globalist. I don't believe he's a globalist. I, I just don't believe that because I don't see the execution on the ground to support that. Um, so I think we need to you know, be clear with him about how we see him and where he's going and we won't, we won't tolerate uh, a lot of what he stands for. I'm, I, I'm appalled when our leaders go to China and don't say anything about human rights. It's just, it's just nuts. It's not, it's not who we are as a country. And this is across political parties here in the United States. And he's got an, he's got an abhorrent human rights record. And he has to be called to account for that. So does, you know, the, the leader in North Korea who's, who even excels in that regard to a much lower level than Xi Jinping with far fewer people. And all those leaders have to, and that's who we, we cannot stray from, I think in all this, not stray from our values. But I don't think we can just come home. 
We can have this isolationist response. We can have this not globalized world. I just don't believe it. There are just too many economic links that there, you can't unglobalize us. How do we? How do we both recognize that and then take advantage of it to support our own interests, which is important, and to, in a, in a peaceful outcome, have a relationship with China that makes, makes it a lot better for the rest of the world. For the Chinese people, those 800 million, that's his problem, not ours, although we'll have an impact on that, and for the rest of the world. Okay. Yeah, I think over here, yeah. Uh, Steve Winters, uh, independent consultant and actually a Hopkins alumnus. Uh, Admiral, uh, thank you so much for your remarks reiterating dangers of nuclear weapons. My question is, as, as you're probably very well aware, the former Secretary of Defense, uh, William Perry, has been very active in this same area for, for years. Yeah. And, but what, what strikes me is that when I read the uh, uh, pr presentations by, the, shall we say, the nuclear policy establishment, whether it's at the think tanks here in D.C., or an actually U.S. military publications discussing a nuclear strategy, there is almost a uniform dismissal or dismissiveness of William Perry, almost as if he's gone rogue, almost as if they want to draw a line. No, he's gone too far, you can't, you can't say that, or whatever. And, and could you comment on that? Because it sort, of, it sort of presents a wall. I mean, people may be afraid to speak up uh, on, on, on the issues. Bill Perry is, a, is the paragon on this issue as far as I'm concerned. He is the guiding light. I'm not saying he's got everything right, but he has spent so much time and capital and intellectual energy on this subject. I don't think anybody knows more. I am, to just reiterate what I said earlier, I have been struck, and I tried to 10 years ago create some interest in, in strategic deterrence since it went away in 1989 or 91. Uh, because it was so effective and deterring Paul Bracken, who's a friend of mine, wrote a great book out of Yale a couple of years ago on you know deterrence, deterrence in the 21st century, strategic nuclear weapons deterrence. I just haven't seen much work on that period, so I'm not sure. I guess I not to take anybody on because I'm not overly familiar with all the everybody that's dismissing Perry, but um, I. I don't know that we've done enough work to, that we could stand up and say we shouldn't listen to Bill Perry. That, that's kind of how, I, that's where I'd start anyway. Show me your work. Do you have a better idea on these really critical issues? Because he has a ton of credibility and it's easy, it's so easy to uh, write somebody off without being substantive. You know, show me your plan before you start saying Bill Perry is irrelevant. Thank you. Um, my name is Leah from Voice of America's Mentor Service. Um, Adam Mullins, good to see you good again. See you again. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just okay. Pick up a little. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just a very quick follow-up to this national defense uh, security strategy. I wonder if you endorse the uh, Trump administration's approach to treat China and Russia as a long-term strategic rival. And the second question I have is that we, we know President Trump is not known for um, seeking advice, um, but uh, if you were asked, what kind of specific advice do you have for him as he goes into this talk with Kim Jong-un? So I never talked about the specific advice I gave the two presidents that I work for, much less giving advice to the president that I don't work for at all. So, <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I mean, I understand you're saying he doesn't seek advice. I mean, I read all the time he's getting advice. It's who he's getting advice from, I think, that, that is certainly uh, uh, out there uh, in the media. Um, what, and the first, I'm sorry, the first part was, oh, that, yeah, I actually do. I believe that this is a more trying time than even when I was young. Potentially not as existential, meaning the nuclear weapons we had with the Soviet Union, that, that was wipe out the face of the earth and eliminate two countries. So even though we, have the, we still have those weapons, we have, far, we have too many and far fewer than we used to, 
Um, and I mean, just briefly, one of my worries about Putin is we screw up the relationship with Putin so badly, who doesn't have much, that somehow he starts to reach back for these weapons to remind everybody that he is a player. And that would be a disaster, specifically. So in a way, we have the, the evolving landscape of terrorism, the evolving landscape of isolation nationalism throughout the world, um, and an increasing divide globally between the haves and the have-nots. I've heard more about haves and have-nots in my own country in the last five years than I have the last five decades. And we need to wake up to that, quite frankly. That's what this election in 2016, from my perspective, that's what it was all about. Those that we've left behind here. So you have all that underpinning, and then you have the growth of these two. You could argue for limits on Russia of some sort. Um, but again, Western, Western metrics, in my, my experience, don't necessarily work very well against individuals like Putin. I know he's got a bad economy. I know energy isn't doing well. His demographics are bad. His infrastructure is bad, et cetera. Putin, like Xi Jinping, is going to run that country until he can no longer breathe. That's my belief. Um, and so that's why we need a relationship. So he's going to play, and I think we need to be mindful of that. And he clearly has invested in his strategic forces, which we need to counter. And then Xi Jinping is, you know, China's coming gangbusters with their, with their defense capability, and they would like us to leave the Western Pacific. Someone said, and I thought this was a great part of the strategy, or a very clear depiction of the Chinese strategies, and I can't remember which Chinese leader said it, but the Pacific is a big ocean. You know, you just take the east and we'll take the west and everything will be okay. That's just not going to happen. And it's back to the, our allies and friends and the economic breadbasket of the world, if you will, to make sure that's stable. So I think we have all these other things plus China and Russia. In a way, the strategy is rightfully focused now on all of this. Well, Admiral Mullen, you've been very generous with your time and insight, so I think we'll take time for one last question, and, uh, and then we can... Thanks. I'm Jeff Price. I teach here at SAIS. Uh, good to see you, Admiral. Thanks, Jim. Um, with respect to the Iran deal, what, in your assessment, would be the likely effect if the United States were to withdraw unilaterally from the Iran nuclear deal, specifically on the prospects for denuclearization in Korea, but also more broadly in the international security environment? I don't think, there's no question it's going to have an impact on what happens with North Korea, although I honestly don't know what it will be. I, I just, uh, I've watched President Trump, he'll, my own view is he'll have a way of, of di disconnecting the two or deconflicting the two, if you will. The Iran deals, it's a very complex deal. It's not just there, the options available to him aren't just in or out. There are, there are sanctions, yes, sanctions, no. Clearly, our European friends have been working to, under, try, first of all, try to get him to not withdraw. And then secondly, if he withdraws, whatever, that, whatever the specifics of that are, is somehow keep it in play. What I do, so, but there are two really significant strategic critical masses to me. One is nuclear weapons in the Middle East. Uh, what, we don't, what we don't spend a, think about think about North Korea and how quickly he's advanced this capability, much faster than his father, because he's focused on it, and he's got bright people. Uh, what we forget about Iran is how bright they are. And you, I mean, I know enough to know, I know how quick they can bring this capability back if they put their mind to it. So now we're facing uh, potential of nuclear weapons there. Plus, and I just never, it's one of these things, I can't imagine I'm even having this part of the conversation. A few years ago, to say that I'd be spending any time on relationships in Europe that just so weren't sort of natural because we've been together for so long, those are starting to come apart. And if we get out and Europe stays in, then that's a real breach, another breach, potentially, between us and of any continent in the world, not exclusively, uh, in a world where I argue, in a confused world, 
let's stick with our friends. Let's stick with countries or regions that have the same values, the same principles, until we can kind of sort out where all this goes. So we start to undo that, then you've got a, you've got a nuclear weapons potential in the Middle East. You've got a European connection which is fraying. Also, sit, and sitting on top of that, literally to the north is Putin, uh, to the northeast. And so it just, um, the, the, I guess the current empirical data is it makes things a lot worse without a lot of specifics. Well, thank you. This okay, has been sobering, you. thoughtful, and tremendously well. Thank you.